All right. Thank you, everybody, for joining us. We are very, very excited uh, to have you on board for another session with Dr. Tom. You ask and Dr. Tom answers. And we have been bombarded with questions, so many, in fact, that we're going to have to break these down into various topic groupings. And today, what we're going to be talking about is gluten alternatives, which glutens, not glutens, other wheats, et cetera, everything to do with food, because that is clearly at the top of all of these fabulous people, Dr. Tom, who are looking to improve their health. So yes. in order to get to as many as possible, what we're going to do is we're going to try to see if we can't kind of really kind of circle through these. So without ever, ever stopping uh, your wisdom from coming out and being shared with us, um, we're going to try to move through as many as we can because I assure you we have too many to get through, but we're going to jump right in. So you ready? Ready. All right. So this first question, and, and by the way, for everybody that's watching, I had a chance to, or listening, I had a chance to compress a number of these. If we see the same uh, question coming up, I'll reference a number of people who may have submitted it to us. So this one is from Dasha Andrews and Marsha Angel. By the way, I'll only include your full name if you disclose it also on YouTube. And the question is this, Tom, what about millet, oats, quinoa, and sprouted grains? What can you tell us about those? Great. Let's, um, uh, oats is a really good example. That's, that's the first one. When oats grow out of the ground, there's no toxic gluten in them. When you buy oats off the shelf, there's toxic gluten in them. And they did a study where they looked at three different types of oats, McCann's, which is produced in an oats only facility in Ireland, Quaker, everybody knows Quaker in the US, and Country, Country Choice, which is a national organic oats. And they bought samples of them at four different times of year, so in every season. So they had 12 samples that they looked at. And, of the, and to be labeled as gluten-free, it has to be less than 20 parts per million. The Quaker oats was as much as 3,000 parts per million. Uh, the lowest number, I think, was 600 and something, but, which is just ridiculously high. But the highest was over 3,000 parts per million. The country choice, uh, two of the four were gluten-free. The other two were not. They were the organic ones. And the McCann's, one of the four, was gluten-free. So what does that tell us? It's that the contamination in the oat fields, when the oats are growing, maybe the wheat down the road, some seeds blew over and got in with the oats and they're growing up in there, or the manufacturing facility, or the trucks that carry the harvested oats to the manufacturing facility, the trucks carried wheat last week, and they don't clean the trucks. So it's very difficult to use oats unless you get oats that are labeled gluten-free. Those are the ones that by law, they have to make sure are gluten-free. So uh, whether they're organic or whether they're from an oats-only facility, if they don't say on the label gluten-free, you're more likely to get contamination with oats. What about uh, millet, quinoa, and sprouted grains? Millet is safe as a grain to eat. I've never seen a study looking at comparing different samples of millet. I don't know that there is such a study. In general, it's very safe. There's no toxic gluten in it. Quinoa, now this is quite a story about quinoa. <laughs> um, they, they looked at 15 different um, strains of quinoa. They published this study in 2015. They looked at 15 different strains. Now, quinoa grows in the U.S. No, 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 it doesn't. It grows in Peru. No, it grows in the U.S. No, 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 it grows in Peru. It only grows in Peru. No, as of over a decade now, farmers in the U.S. have been growing quinoa in the Midwest. Well, how do you grow a grain that grows at the altitude in Peru? How do you grow it in the U.S.? They crossbred the quinoa with grasses in the U.S., they cross-bred it in the laboratory, and that's what they grow in the U.S. So they looked at four different strains of quinoa. No, correct that. They looked at 15 different strains of quinoa. Four of them had measurable toxic levels of gluten. But it's quinoa. But you don't know where it's from. 
But in general, quinoa is the grain that I prefer more than any other. If I'm going to eat a grain, I will eat, I prefer quinoa. It's the highest protein and usually the purest source. I don't know which strains are safer than others in quinoa. I don't know. Uh, if I could get my hands on Peruvian quinoa, that's the one that I would order, but, I, but they're not marketed that way. So uh, we, we run a risk, but I think that risk is minimized with uh, quinoa more than it is with oats, for example. Okay. So any, any words on sprouted grains? Um, the concept of sprouting wheat berries to make the wheat safer to eat is uh, theoretically it's helpful in breaking down the proteins, but it's never been demonstrated in the laboratory. Now, some people will say, well, I feel better if I eat sprouted grain. I don't feel the same as if I eat whole wheat. I feel better. Feeling is important, but that doesn't tell you a clue of what your immune system's doing. And that's the bottom line is, is my immune system trying to protect me? And you don't feel when your immune system's pr trying to protect you. But when it's doing that, there often is a, um, if we use the term collateral damage that occurs where other tissue can be damaged when your immune system is trying to protect you from the food that you're eating. Gotcha. And you just don't know when you're eating that food. You just don't know. So here was a really interesting question. Now, this might be a tough one. I was like, oh, let's see if you come up. We'll see if I can stump you at all. It came in from Gillian or Jillian Oglesby, who is asking, how come wheat berries that you just referenced are used in Chinese medicine? That's a really good question. And I don't have a clue. No, no, I do have a clue. Um, there are some great benefits to wheat. There's no question wheat has saved millions and millions of lives. There's no question. Of course it has. You know, when there's a famine in Africa and we send boatloads of wheat over there, you save millions of lives. It's, um, it's, it's a decent protein. It's a pretty good protein as grains grow. As grains go, it's a good protein um, to help us um, even thrive. But the, the side effects of wheat is what's become more of a problem today. So wheat berries, I'm not an expert in Chinese medicine, so I don't know the features of wheat berries that they're specifically looking to capture in their medical concoctions. But wheat's not, um, I, I'm not quite sure how to say this, it's not that it's a poison for you, but just that our digestive system can't break it down completely. And if you've heard any of my other talks, we understand it's this thing called oral tolerance, meaning when you're fighting so many things, your immune system is trying to protect you, fighting you from all these toxic chemicals and heavy metals and the poisons we're exposed to every day. And you take wheat, which is a minor toxin, a minor toxin, not a major poison, but a minor toxin, but when your immune system is fighting so many different things, now here comes a minor irritant, but it's already so hypervigilant, it goes, you aren't coming in either. And you start fighting wheat. Mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. uh, but wheat has saved millions of lives. There's no question about that. But our tolerance level has, uh, has gone up to here now as mm -hmm. humans. That's why more kids are getting sick earlier, earlier and more um, degenerative diseases are being diagnosed, more autoimmune diseases, more Alzheimer's, more Parkinson's than ever before. It's because as a species, our tolerance is, it's, we're, we're, we've crossed the threshold. We can't handle much, uh, any more irritant. And wheat, as a minor irritant, the body says, nope, not going to let that in. Boom, and we start fighting it. And so a question came in from Adrian Rain, who said, does it matter if the wheat is genetically modified or how the actual wheat is prepared? It does, uh, uh, for the first part. It does. The GMO wheats, although they're not that available commercially, um, the, the Roundup treated wheat, treated for GMO, um, is very common. But the strains of wheat that are genetically modified are not that common yet. But does it matter? Absolutely it matters. You know, they spray the fields with Roundup. They spray the wheat fields two weeks before um, they harvest the wheat. They spray it with Roundup. Roundup is the chemical for GMO plants. GMO plants, why do you make a plant, why do you genetically modify a plant? You modify it so that you can pour this poison on the plant called Roundup, and it won't kill the plant. 
but what it does kill is the bugs and the weeds that are around the plant. So that's why we do GMO. So the spraying the wheat fields with Roundup, this weed killer, it kills the wheat. So why do you want to kill the wheat before you harvest it? Because it dries it out. And when it dries out, it does two things. It kills the wheat. In the process of killing the wheat, the wheat tries to bring all of the energy from the soil up into the seeds to try to uh, help the species survive. It's an automatic reaction. The plant knows it's going to die. It grabs all the energy it can and throws it into the seeds. So the seeds are more potent now with the life of the plant. And thus, your, the wheat kernels, the wheat berries, have more nutrient in them. That's one reason they kill the plant before they harvest it. The second is that it doesn't plug up the combines. Uh, so when farmers realize that, that's what farmers thought about. Oh, if we spray this two weeks earlier, it doesn't plug up my combine. And I can get more harvest done, which was the rationale as to why they started doing that. So all of the non-organic wheat products in the U.S. now, over 90% of them, I can't say all, over 90% of them have residue of Roundup in the bread, in the muffins, in the cookies, in the croutons, in the noodles. Chicken noodle soup, the noodles, has Roundup residue that comes into our body. It accumulates in our body. It takes that threshold. It raises us up over our threshold. We lose oral tolerance. Then the body starts fighting wheat and any other minor irritants that it's being exposed to. Wow, that sounds like pretty horrible, actually. <laughs> um, yeah, uh, uh, I'd like to stay with this one for a moment because this is really, this is the wake-up call that the World Wildlife Fund published a study about four, just under four months ago now with two major universities, and they showed there's been a 57% reduction on average, 57% reduction of all wildlife on the planet since 1970. What? Mm -hmm. What? More than half of everything that lives on the planet has been killed off in 46 years? Yes. In 46 years, more than half of it has been killed off. The bumblebees, the honeybees, the earthworms, the rainbow trout, the polar bears, the cheetahs, the Baltimore Orioles, the red robins. More than half of everything has been killed off in 46, 47 years. And that average percentage of 57% is higher around fresh water. Why? Because they're drinking the water. The animals drink the water. If we were drinking the water coming out of the stream by your house, you'd get cancer really quick also, and you wouldn't be able to reproduce also. That the level of toxins, when I talk about spraying the wheat fields and we get this minor dose all the time, we're getting the same chemicals the animals are, but we just filter the water so the chemicals are in lower amounts, but they're accumulating in our bodies and we cross this threshold. Now we're fighting everything and you get autism goes up and autoimmune diseases go up. It's this toxic world that we're in that we all have to wake up to. Mm -hmm. So <laughs> got a question that was very interesting. Never heard about this one. This one comes in from Evelyn White, who is asking, what about ancient wheat or Franken wheat? Yeah. Is that different in gluten? Yes, it is. Um, and they did studies on that at Harvard. They compared the ancient strains of wheat. They, they, they took four strains of wheat, two of the ancient strains and two of the modern strains. And they looked at it to see how toxic was it to the human digestive tract. And they found that all four strains were toxic to the human digestive tract. The modern strains were much more toxic. Mm -hmm. So, well, does that mean I can eat the ancient strains? No, because you've been eating the modern strains. Well, we don't know unless you do the proper testing. If you have elevated antibodies to any of the peptides of wheat, and there's more than one, most of your doctors only check one. There's many more than one that you have to check for. But if you have elevated antibodies to any of the parts of wheat that the digestive system breaks it down into, that means you've crossed the line and you can't have any wheat because even the ancient strains will trigger more of the autoimmune reaction. But theoretically, if you have a newborn baby and you're going to, actually we'll, we'll, do, a, uh, we'll do a whole session on introducing wheat to children and how to do that, because that's a long topic. But theoretically, you would use the ancient grains to do that. 
Okay. And what about spelt gluten? That's a question coming in from Nico Van Gelder saying, is, is spelt gluten okay? Yeah, unfortunately, it's not, Nico. Um, it's part of the wheat family. It's an earlier form of wheat, uh, a simpler form of wheat. It's not ancient, but it's somewhere in the middle in terms of its history, but it's still the wheat protein family. So I, the great question came in from John uh, Dudna. I believe that's a correct pronunciation. Sorry, John, if I didn't get that right. Can combinations of foods assist in the protein breakdown so that bad gluten, quote unquote, could be better assimilated? Um, that's a really interesting theoretical question. I've never seen it as a proposed protocol. Uh, so if I hide my bite of bread in the midst of the mashed potatoes, is that going to cause as much of a problem? And the answer is, well, <laughs> maybe not. Maybe you can slip some of it through. I don't know, man. That's, that's an interesting <laughs> one. Um, I wouldn't want to risk it because when you turn on your immune system, as you know, if you've heard some of these earlier talks, the damage is not that you make antibodies to wheat. The damage is that the antibodies to wheat attack your brain or they attack your thyroid or they attack your joints. And three months, six months, five years later, you got brain problems because your, your immune system has been attacking your brain from the sensitivity to wheat or you have heart problems. So that's the danger. So mm -hmm. it's not that you, um, you won't feel bad if you mix your wheat in the mashed potatoes. May maybe you won't, I don't know. But does it trigger the immune system? And the mm -hmm. only way to know, the only way to know on that one, Nico, is that you do the blood test, you do the proper blood test, you see, oh, I got a problem with wheat, okay. You completely eliminate it for six months to a year. Then you do another blood test. You say, oh, look, all those antibodies are gone to wheat. Good. So can I hide it now in my mashed potatoes? And the answer is nobody knows. But go ahead and try, man. Go ahead and try. You now have a platform of, of tests that you've done so that you can monitor. It's like the uh, temperature gauge on your dashboard of your car. You know, some cars, all they have is a hot light. Other cars have a temperature gauge. It slowly starts to climb. And you can see when you're getting close to the red zone. So you, you did initial tests, the proper type of testing. You had a problem. You applied the protocol six months to a year. You did the test again. No problem. Now you hide the wheat in the mashed potatoes or whatever you're thinking of. And you wait six months or three months is enough. You wait three months and you check again. And if the hot light has come back on again, you know, or the temperature gauge has gone back up again, you know that you can't do that. Mm -hmm. But if it doesn't come back up, then maybe you can get away with it. Maybe. Yeah, and that one was from John. John, thank you very much. Okay, so uh, got another one came in from Marylise Cusick saying, what about Japanese pasta from a root? Is that okay? Um, uh, um, yeah, the most common Japanese pasta is called ramen, and that's made from wheat. Uh, but pasta is made from different roots. Uh, uh, generally are okay. Pastas made from bean sprouts are okay. Pastas made from rice in general are okay, unless you have a sensitivity to rice. Um, uh, so yeah, the, the roots that they use, as far as I know, the roots they use to make pastas um, in general are okay. Okay, thank you. We got Salvador Espinoza coming in with a question saying, what about organic chips made from olive oil Paleo coconut wraps or canyon bread from non-GMO rice? They all sound great to me. I actually use the coconut wraps to make uh, kind of my own version of a sandwich every once in a while. You know, and I, I take a coconut wrap and I take some avocado and spread it on there. And then I'll take either chicken or leftover fish from last night and I put it in there. A little bit of lettuce and I put a little turmeric in there and I roll it up and that's what I eat for lunch. Uh, so you bet. You bet. Those are great. Nice. Okay. So here's a great question. This, uh, this I think a lot of people are really, in fact, there were many people who had spin-offs of this question. I actually took it from Brianna Aladef, who said, what can people eat that has crunch or texture to help them wean themselves off to transition away from gluten and wheat. Well, what's out there? What are the alternatives, the good ones? You know, for those, for those people that want crunch, nothing has been 
as satisfying to me as cassava crackers. They are unbelievably good and they're really crunchy. And I like to put a little um, organic grass-fed butter on them. And then I'll uh, 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 also put um, a little salt, a little sea salt on them. And so you have to find good cassava crackers. And my friends uh, up in Berkeley, they opened a restaurant called Mission Heirloom. It's in Berkeley. And it's cutting edge, state of the art, the purest of the pure. They are fanatical. They are just fanatics on highest quality. They went to three different countries in Latin America and went to the farms to see what supplier were they going to use for cassava crackers. They went to Costa Rica, they went to Honduras, and they went to one other country, I don't remember where, and they went out, you know, they rented cars, they drive out into the jungles, they go out to these farms, they met the presidents of the local cassava farmers' guilds, and to look, see how they manufacture this stuff. They tried a bunch of different crackers, and they've got crackers that you can order that are cassava crackers that you've got the crunch with those. They're really nice. They're really nice. That's missionheirloom.com. Okay. What else? So cassava crackers is one. What else can you give us? I'm thinking, but said, come on, man, give us another one or two. Yeah, well, you know, you can do the uh, 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 glutino crackers. Uh, that are in most of the supermarkets, like Whole Foods supermarket or natural food supermarkets. Um, the problems with those, um, sometimes they're using guar gums in some of them. You know, there's some other stuff in some of these crackers. Uh, you, you want the purest things that you can find. Um, last night I had some unexpected guests come from Australia and spent the night. And so uh, what did I have here? Well, I, oh, I've got a box of glutino. So I Opened up a box of Glutino crackers. We made it a little quick guacamole. You know, and we're sitting outside and just dipping and eating. Nice crunch from the Glutino crackers. I don't use them very often. They're gluten-free, uh, but you know, there's some, um, and there's not really bad ingredients in them. I just don't eat crackers very often, but they work really well. Rice cakes, of course, can work really well for you. Uh, and uh, I, I really should have our nutritionists answering that kind of question, because for me, I can just tell you what I do in my house. And mm -hmm. so it's cassava crackers and glutino crackers and rice cakes. Okay. So how about this? This one came in from Christy Hall asking the question, can gluten negatively affect me if I touch a surface that was touched by somebody else who just ate gluten? Whoa. Um, I don't think so. I don't think so. But I did a lecture to a couple hundred physicians in Boston maybe three years ago, and a doctor came up to me at the break and she said, I'm a yellow canary. And I said, oh, sorry, I understand how that is. I'm really glad you're here to learn more about this. She said, oh, me too. And she was so bad that if her boyfriend kissed her three hours after he ate a sandwich, she'd pass out within three or four minutes. That the molecules of, uh, that might be in his saliva uh, or maybe it's the um, air uh, uh, from the food digesting in the stomach was enough to trigger a response in her and she'd pass out. she just pass out. She said when her boyfriend, and because her nervous system was so sensitive. Now that's the yellow canary. That's way, way out there. And those people can't go out to eat um, in public. They have to be really uh, protective. Uh, of the foods that they select and things like that. She said when her boyfriend proposed to her, um, he had a wheelchair there because he knew if her nervous system got too excited, she would pass out. Uh, mm. And mm. she said she didn't. She was so happy she didn't pass out for that one. But <laughs> in terms of touching a surface that someone else has touched after they ate a sandwich, I don't think so. I've never seen a study or a reference to that being a problem. Now, we do know toasters, for example, if someone in the family toasts regular bread in a toaster, and then you put your gluten-free toast in the toaster, that's too much contamination. That even though, wow. crumbs, even though crumbs fall to the bottom of the toaster, and they're not in the rack that's holding the piece of bread, that's enough. There's enough contamination in the gluten-free toast that comes out of the toaster to be a trigger for people. Right, which that takes us back to that comment that you uh, said many times that 
it's even the slightest little bit that'll trigger. So there's no such thing as, oh, I'm just going to have a bite of this cake. Right, right. No, you can't do that. But in terms of touching a surface that someone else has touched uh, that, uh, and they had eaten a sandwich before that, I've never heard of that being a problem. Okay, so here was a question that I know is going to interest the good old boys down in the south. It's from Jay Dice, and his question was, do spirits distilled from grains like wheat, rye, and barley contain gluten after they've been distilled? Um, that's a controversial question. Um, the, the standard answer is no. Distillation takes all the protein out. So it's not supposed to be a problem. Um, but uh, the way you know on all of this stuff, and I'm, I'm not sure that everyone should go gluten-free. I'm not sure. Uh, I am sure that everyone should be checked to see and checked properly to see if their immune system is reacting to wheat. And if your immune system is reacting to wheat, you got to go gluten-free. No question about it because your immune system's there to protect you. And it's that mechanism of trying to protect you that causes, that is a strong contributor to the autoimmune diseases that people get from Alzheimer's to heart disease, to rheumatoid, to psoriasis. So if your immune system is over the line, if you've crossed that line, which we've talked about before, absolutely you need to stop. But people who don't, have an immune, if you do the right testing, it comes back negative, and probably two people, maybe three people out of 10 come back negative when you do the right test, uh, when you're comprehensive in your testing, which means the vast majority of people have already crossed the line. But if you come back negative, I think you're okay. You've still got a window here where um, uh, the information is saying that your body is not reacting to it, so you're probably okay. Uh, but that's not very many people at all. So the so the spirit question is most likely it's not a problem. But the only way to know for sure is to check and see is your immune system reacting? Because once again, everyone remember, it's not what you feel when you eat it that's a problem. It's what your immune system does when you eat it that's the problem. Because if your immune system is fighting that food, the um, uh, collateral damage from those antibodies to wheat can affect your brain or your heart or your liver, or your kidneys or your joints or your muscles or your skin. So that's the problem. And you don't feel that stuff until you've killed off so much tissue. Now it becomes obvious. Mm -hmm. Quick question came in is coming through. We, got, we also have questions coming in through our live feed as well. And so Carolina Fagermo is asking us, what about chia seeds or amaranth? Both are fine. Both are great, great products to use. Um, uh, nothing involved with the uh, uh, exposures to toxic gluten from wheat, rye, or barley it relates to chia seeds or to amaranth. Now, amaranth is a grain, and any grain can be contaminated the way we talked about oats, but in general, amaranth, quinoa, millet, they're excellent grains to use. One question I thought that was a very, maybe a little bit of a challenging one, but I'll throw it at you anyway. And that is Lee Ashford is asking us, okay, you keep talking, talking about testing all the time. He, so his question was, what's the right test or the right blood test I need to do? And how, if I can, can I get my doctor or my insurance to approve it? I, I have um, multiple pieces there. So <laughs> it's, it's really a good question. And, uh, uh, I've talked about this concept before about stepping back. So I'm going to ask everyone to take a step back for a moment and just get the, get, just get the big picture. Thanks, Ridgely, for doing that. That's helpful. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> just to get the big picture. So I was sitting at dinner the other night. I was alone. I was sitting at the bar in one of my favorite restaurants having my salad that I have. And the owner of the bar was talking to these two gals sitting next to me. And uh, they, she obviously knew them, and um, they were talking about health things. And so at some point, I looked at one of them, at the one sitting next to me, and I said, are you in healthcare? She said, yes, I'm a physician at Scripps, and Scripps is a very famous place here in the San Diego area. 
I'm a physician at Scripps and I do acupuncture. I, I include acupuncture. I said, oh, that's fabulous. And um, she actually started saying, she said, you know, I woke up on Monday trying to decide if I could go to work again. And I just looked at her and I could see in her face and I've, I've heard this story many times before. And doctors want to be doctors to help people. They really want to help. They right. really want to help. But they get stuck in a system that keeps them locked in. You've got 20 minutes. That's it. And you can't make recommendations out of, outside of what the hospital has approved. That the, the hospital system has to approve the recommendations you make. You make recommendations outside of that. You, you can get away with it for a little bit, but starts making waves. And if somebody complains, they call you on the carpet. And she wasn't sure if she could go, to back, go back to work anymore because she knew there was so much more in this world of functional medicine that she's not allowed to do in her current situation because she's an employee. She's an employee and she has to toe the line. And, but she, she called in sick that day and she just meditated. She got a massage and she knew that she was going to change how she practices, but she didn't know how to do that. But until she could, she could stay in there and help as best she could with patients and give them some little pearls until she could create an environment that really was ideal. And I just looked at her and I said, uh, you don't know who you're talking to. <laughs> <laughs> and she looked at me and says, well, I'm, <laughs> actually, I'm married. I said, well, so am I. It's okay. I'm not referring to that. And I told her who I am and what I do. And the Institute for Functional Medicine is all about teaching doctors how to get the bigger picture and then how to implement that in their practices. And she just looked and she said, well, I've been to an IFM event before. It was really wonderful. And I said, well, great. There's a whole process of how to transition into the practice of your dreams. There's a way of doing it. You don't do it in a day, right? It's going to take a while, but we've got the system down for you right? So mm -hmm. here you go. And so she said, you know, my angels are just watching over me. She got a little tear in her eye. Mm -hmm. And I said, I know it's great, isn't it? It's great how life just moves us forward so we can help more people. Right? So it was, it was a great moment. So in terms of your doctor and what they can do, it depends on what kind of a system they're in. If they're an employee of a hospital system or a medical system, that has guidelines, you toe the line, you do what we say, then they're stuck. And it causes a great deal of grief for doctors in general. Though, and if they're not, what could they do to help? What can they do to help? Well, uh, study more functional medicine principles, come to some of the courses offered by the Institute for Functional Medicine, and just talk to other doctors who are doing this, who transitioned their practice who transition to not be dictated by insurance and what insurance says is going to work and what's not going to work. The messages that we're trying to get out here in these little quick interviews is what are the basic things you can do that are going to help you, going to help you and your health and the health of your family that don't take a lot of money. So just take a step back and understand the big picture. That's mm -hmm. the first step. That's what we're trying to do here is to help you understand the big picture and you don't get the big picture in one day or in one 15 minute little interview you know you get a, a piece and next time you get a piece and then you get another piece and you say oh i see how that relates to this and then you see how they start to fit together and six months from now your friends are saying i haven't seen you six months you look so different what did you do yeah. because you've been you've been applying these little pieces and you feel i'm no i'm still the same person well my belt's a lot tighter now I have to pull it two notches tighter. I guess I've lost a little weight. You know, your, you know, your mind doesn't recognize the, the tremendous improvements that all these little pieces add up to over the course of months. That's mm -hmm. how you change the direction of your health, is piece by piece by piece. And then what about the blood test? What about the right test? Well, where, yeah. where, what is the best way to do that? Yeah, um, I put a handout together called the Conundrum of Gluten Sensitivity, Why the Tests Are Often Wrong. And it talks about how our doctors were trained to think about testing for wheat sensitivity. 
And what was accurate in the 1990s is not accurate today, but they're still doing the same tests that were done in the 1990s. That science has improved and we know so much more now. And most doctors, when they look for sensitive, Mrs. Patient, proteins are like a pearl necklace. Hydrochloric acid made in your stomach undoes the clasp of the pearl necklace. Now you have a string of pearls. Your digestive enzymes made by the stomach, the pancreas, the gallbladder, the liver, the uh, microbiota, they all help to digest the food. They act like scissors to break down the pearl necklace into smaller clumps of the pearl necklace and smaller clumps and smaller clumps until you've got each pearl of the pearl necklace. That's called an amino acid. And that's what goes through the gut wall into the bloodstream is the amino acids. And your body takes these amino acids, these building blocks, and makes new bone cells or new brain cells or new hormones from it. But it's got to be in the form of a brick. You can't take a 24-piece clump of brick wall that was broken off and try to make a new wall with that, right? You need the individual bricks. So you get these clumps of the, the problem with weed is that no one can break down the pearl necklace into each pearl of the pearl necklace. You, we don't have the enzymes. No human has the enzymes. The best you can do is clumps of the pearl necklace. And there are over 62 clumps of the pearl necklace that have been identified as triggering an immune, re immune response, potentially triggering an immune response, over 62. Every laboratory in the country tests one clump. It's a 33 pearl clump called alpha glidin. That's what they test. So your doctor does a blood test. If it comes back negative, he says, no, you don't have a problem with wheat. See, here's the blood test. You're fine. And if you were to say, but doctor, isn't that only checking one clump of the pearl necklace? He won't know what you're talking about. He'll think you're like blabbering. But if you say, well, doctor, isn't alpha glidin only one peptide of multiple peptides of poorly digested wheat? Then he'll just kind of look at you and say, what have you been reading? And then you hand him the handout that you download from my website that's got all the references, the science references to this. And he goes, wow, I never knew that. I never knew that. Well, that's really interesting information. So six years ago, seven years ago, a new test came out that looked at 10 different clumps of the pearl necklace. It changed the world in terms of testing. And thousands of doctors know about that now, but hundreds of thousands still don't, right? But there are thousands of doctors that do. Now a new lab has just come out that looks at over 30 of these peptides of poorly digested wheat. So you want to do one of these tests. The test that I currently recommend is called the Wheat Zoomer, Z-O-O-M-E-R, the Wheat Zoomer. And it looks at, I think it's about, it's 26, 28, maybe 30 peptides of wheat. I just haven't counted one, two, three. I just haven't counted them. I, I should count them up so I can give you the exact number. But it's somewhere between 26 and 30 peptides of wheat. And when we do that test, seven or eight out of 10 people come back positive. And it's a very, very accurate test, very accurate. It's the whole new world of laboratory technology that just came on the market uh, for doctors to use. And, but it looks at many more peptides. So if that test comes back negative, that's the one that I can, then all I can say to you is, well, I guess you've got a strong immune system. You know, you're, you, you have a strong gut. Your body is tolerating this wheat right now. It's okay for you to eat wheat, but just do this test once a year to make sure that you don't, you don't cross the line, right? That's yeah. how I would answer that question for that and, person. And obviously people can find out more about wheat zoomer on the doctor.com. Right, the dr.com, the dr.com. Yeah, go check it out. So, okay, wrapping this up. So we've talked all about all kinds of different uh, foods. We talked about millets and oats and quinoa and grain and gluten. And I would recommend that everybody maybe go back to the beginning of this, have a notepad next to them because, hey, you told us that certain things were good. Coconut wraps are okay. And we heard about uh, the chia seeds and we heard about, and we heard about some great cassava crackers and uh, some sources, glutino crackers. But after that, pretty much what we're saying is seven out of eight people are likely already sensitive to wheat. And whether you like it or not, it ain't good for you no more. That's right. That's right. And it's a primary gasoline on the fire. The average in the U.S. is 132.5 pounds of wheat consumption 
per person per year, 132 and a half pounds. I don't eat any. That means someone else is eating 265 pounds of wheat per year. 265 pounds. And that's a primary gasoline on the fire that's causing the inflammation that's pulling on your chain. And the weakest link in your chain is going to break if it's your heart, your brain, your liver, your kidneys, wherever that weak link is. And then you get Alzheimer's or Parkinson's. Or then you get rheumatoid arthritis. Or then you get heart attacks. Or wherever the weak link in your chain is. So what we want to do, remember I said the big, uh, take a step back. The big picture view is I want to stop pulling on my chain so hard, or I want to stop the pulling on the chain for my daughter or my son uh, with their recurrent ear infection. Somehow we're pulling on the chain. What are we doing that's pulling on the chain? Mm -hmm. And so um, wheat, because it's a primary food that we eat multiple times a day, every day, it's the first target to go after. And when you cut that one out, you stop throwing so much gasoline on the fire, many people find they start losing weight, they feel better, they're sleeping better, their headaches reduce, whatever their weak link is, the symptoms start going down for most people when they do that. All right, well, Dr. Tom, again, thank you so much. And as we stated at the beginning, you ask, Dr. Tom answers, please continue with your comments, your feedback, your questions. We are going to answer those questions that come up most often because unfortunately we just can't get to all of them. I want to thank everybody for their contributions to making this a great, great presentation. Very much learning. And Tom, thank you especially. We look forward to the next one. Thank you, Ridgely. And thank you, everyone.